And um, over the last couple of months, the ministry has really started to, to get traction. And so that is the, the heart of what I'd like to kick off with this evening. It's just talking around uh, mission today, because I think it is also a very valid topic for us that might not be in, in, in the official church anymore. Most of us are still very mission orientated. And so for our mission to continue, we obviously need support of people. We need people to stand with us. There's no hierarchy in a mission. That's the one thing I've realized and I'm very thankful for. And each and every person in uh, our ministry, for instance, uh, knows that. They, are, are ha they have the freedom to contribute, uh, to make their voices known. And I know that's also so in BETV. And that's why people become loyal to a, to a mission and to a ministry. And that's really what I want to talk is how are we going to go forward in these modern times and these really unsettling times where things have gone and have become really out of hand and not wanting to work against the church, but rather utilizing the church's resources and what the church has given us before we were so unceremoniously, some of us asked to leave, to utilize that and to in our hearts be thankful for what we've learned. And so the, I entitled my um, uh, uh, presentation this evening, because it's not a sermon, it's more a presentation, Working in Faith, the Wants and Needs of Mission Today. So this generation, to the same work he has called his people in this generation. To them he has revealed his will, and of them he requires obedience. In the last days of this earth's history, the voice that spoke from Sinai is still saying to men, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In Exodus 23, um, it's, it says that man has set his will against the will of God, but he cannot silence this word of command. The human mind can never fully comprehend its obligation to the higher power but it cannot evade the obligation. Profound theories and speculations may abound. And let's face it, there are many of them today. Men may try to silence in opposition to revelation. And that happens every single minute. And thus do away with the law of God, which has become the norm. But stronger and still stronger will the Holy Spirit being before them command. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 14. So having said that and put the foundation, there is only one thing really at the end of the day that God has for us, God's purpose for his people. It is God's purpose to manifest through his people the principles of his kingdom, that in life and character, they may reveal these principles. He desires to separate them from the customs, the habits, and the practices of the world. He seeks to bring them near to himself, that he may make known to them his will. And Brother Lem spoke about the Sabbath and the Sabbaths, the plural. You know, for me, the Sabbath is really a time of reflection. It really has become the time that I study and I want to move closer to my Lord. I remember being in a church and we spoke about it last week as well. Really getting so tired at the end of, of Sabbath, running around, going through three services, sometimes preaching, sometimes taking Sabbath school, doing so much during the day. And then after Sabbath, after Vespers, we then opened the bookshop. And so the Sabbath was a basic 12-hour day for me with no rest. And it was always said that, you know, um, the, you're not supposed to rest in the sense of taking it easy, going slow, or just sitting down and taking a moment. So the rest to me became an anomaly within the church, and I became very tired. This was his purposes in deliverance of Israel from Egypt. At the burning bush, Moses received from God the message for the king 
of Egypt. Let my people go that they may serve me. And that's Exodus 7, 16. It is a small sentence, but a profound sentence, because that is where mission started. That is the command to us, straight from the Lord, that we may serve him. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God brought out the Hebrew host from the land of bondage. Wonderful was the deliverance he wrought for them, punishing their enemies who refused to listen to his word with total destruction. God desired to take his people apart from the world and prepare them to receive his word. From Egypt, he led them to Mount Sinai, where he revealed them his glory. He was nothing to attract the senses or divert their minds from God. And as the vast multitude looked at lofty mountains towering above them, they would realize their own nothingness in the sight of God. So in terms of this, really at the end of the day, we have to think that God brought them to a silent place. And once again, that silent place really is where we have to move as we talk about mission, as we go through the preparedness, as we do mission. There has to be some silence and some retrospection and some introspection. So beside these rocks, immovable except by the power of the divine will, God communicated with men. And that his word might ever be clear and distinct in their minds, he proclaimed amid thunder and lightning and with terrible majesty the law which he had given in Eden and which was the transcript of his character. And the words were written on tables of stone by the finger of God. Thus the will of the infinite God was revealed to a people who were called to make known to every nation, kindred and tongue, the principles of his government in heaven and earth. And so the mission started. And the mission was to let people know that there is a living God. Ellen White writes, workers for Christ are never to think, much less to speak, of failure in their work. When I read this, I actually had to read a second time. Because how many times have I not complained about my failures in my work, in the mission? The times I moaned about the shop being closed down and seeing it as a failure. The times that I had to go through trials and tribulations in church because people did not understand what I was saying. All of these things took my focus away from what God had set me upon and what the, the road he had set me upon. So she says, the Lord Jesus is our efficiency in all things. His spirit is our inspiration. And as we place ourselves in his hands to be channels of light, our means of doing good will never be exhausted. There is one inherent thing that the Lord has given us, and that is the means to do good. Every single person has that within them, and that is the spark that ignites mission. We may draw upon his fullness and receive of th that grace, which has no limit. What a wonderful saying. So the time is now, and I know we've, we've many times over our years, and for those of you who have been lifelong seven-day Adventist, I've only been an Adventist 12 years, but it feels like a lifetime. And I remember so clearly asking the Lord in 2008, Lord, give me something, anything for, to do for you. I couldn't sing, so no choir. I couldn't really be an elder because I'm not very good at managing people or managing a church. But the one thing I really knew was how to speak to people and how to communicate with people and how to tell them about the Lord. And so the Lord provided me with a ministry. And we'll look at that in a moment. We are nearing the close of the earth's history. We have before us a great work, the closing work, of giving the last warning message to a sinful world. There are men who will be taken from the plow, 
from the vineyard and from various other branches of work and sent forth by the Lord to give this message to the world. Are you one of those people? The world is out of joint. As we look at the picture, the outlook seems discouraging. But Christ greets with hopeful assurance the very men and women who cause us discouragement. In them, he sees the qualifications that will enable them to take the place in his vineyard. If they will constantly be learners, through his providence, he will make them men and women fitted to do the work that is not beyond their capabilities. Through the impartation of the Holy Spirit, he will give them the power of utterance. I've heard so many times people say, you know, I can't speak in front of people. I am a very uh, shy person. Yes, I can understand that. I speak in front of people for a li- for, 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 uh, 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 for work. So I'm a trainer by profession. And I have been speaking to people my whole life in all the types of work that the Lord has given me. So for me, I'm very comfortable in speaking to strangers in front of people. um, And I have no fear of that. But I do understand the fear people have within themselves to do that. And those people have other ways of, of communicating. That should not keep us away from mission. The fact that we feel that we cannot communicate with people. The Holy Spirit will give you the power of utterance. It might not be in a great hall with a great number of people, but it will be one-on-one. The common people are to take their places or place as workers, sharing the sorrows of their fellow men. As the Savior shared the sorrows of humanity, they will by faith see him working with them. I saw that Sandy was asking for testimonies, and I really want you to think about that as well in this next week. Not quite sure where on the program she's put that, but I would like to hear some testimonies, some stories of the Lord's successes in your life. Because this is the week that we are supposed to be joyous. We have gone through the Day of Atonement. We have eight days of reflection before we get to the first day of Tabernacles. And so with that, how are we going to to spend this week? We spend it by praising the Lord for everything he has done for us, by testifying to others, by using the power of utterance, by telling our stories. And so what is the greatest want? The greatest want of the world is the want of men. And may I say women. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest men who do not fear to call sin by its right name men whose conscience are as true to duty as the needle to the pole men who will stand for the right through the heavens fall think about that very very carefully do we honest are we honest in our dealings with people Are we honest in what we tell people, in what we believe? And how do we come across when we do that? So understanding the need is understanding the work. And so I took this from uh, uh, an article that I read recently. And one of the slides, it said, our greatest need is the Holy Spirit. Our need is for divine forgiveness to understand justification, to know that there's salvation in Christ, and through that, grow in Christ through our daily walk with God. What do we need the most in our spiritual life? What is the greatest spiritual need? We all feel a lack of power in our lives. We want to be good and to do good, but we feel weak and powerless, and often we do things we do not want to do. However, our God wants to help and lead us from the very first step to the very last. He wants to give us victory every day. So how do you ask me, how will you do that? By our total surrendering and commitment to God through his Holy Spirit. 
this should be the very apex of the pyramid of our needs. So the greatest, thus our greatest need is the presence of the Holy Spirit, because even our capitulation and surrendering to God come as a result of the Holy Spirit working in our life. If that presence is not there and you have felt the presence before, you will know when it's lacking in your life. When things go wrong, when you say the wrong thing, when you do the wrong thing, you will know. Because in your heart, it is still present. Jesus Christ stresses that God willingly and gladly gives his children the Holy Spirit. If you then through you are evil, or sorry, though you are evil, know to give the good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11, 13. Ellen White confirmed that our greatest need is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives because in the gift of the Holy Spirit, all our needs are fulfilled. So no wonder that the donation of the Holy Spirit was the greatest gift God could ever bestow on finite man. And through that comes revival. Ellen White eloquently underscored this on many occasions. Consider carefully and prayerfully the following quotations. Repentance as well as forgiveness is a gift of God through Christ. It is through the influence of the Holy Spirit that we are convinced of sin and feel our need of pardon. None but the contrite are forgiven, but it's the grace of the Lord that makes the heart penitent. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. We must have the holy unction from God, the baptism of his spirit. This is the only efficient agent in the promulgation of sacred truth. It is the spirit of God that quickens the lifelike, lifeless faculties of the soul to appreciate heavenly things and attracts the affections toward God and the truth. What we need, what we cannot do without, is the power of the Holy Spirit to work with our efforts. All pampering of self must be at an end. There is a weakness of intellect, a lack of religious fervor in those who want to lean upon others to be petted, waited on, and propped up. There must be an earnest longing, a soul hunger for the presence of the Lord. Make him your support, your front guard, and your rearward. The Spirit of God, as it comes into the heart by faith, is the beginning of life eternal. What promise is less fulfilled in the church than that of endowment of the Holy Spirit? Here is our greatest need. Let the spirit of controversy be put away, and let us seek for the living testimony of the Spirit of God. Last night, I was sitting on an airplane flying back uh, from a week up in Johannesburg and I flicked through my Facebook and on one of my remember photos of eight years ago a person asked a very very how would I put it aggressive question and for a moment I thought about it and the question was centered around the calendar and why we have Feast of Tabernacles when we do it. And for a moment, I wanted to become irritated. And for a moment, I thought, you know, is this person looking for a fight? And then I, th I heard the Lord speak to me and say, Hein, just say what you believe. Let me do the work in him. So the teacher must be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then the mind and spirit of Christ will be in him, and he will confess Christ in a spiritual and holy life. He will give evidence that the truth he has received has not been merely in theory, but has been sanctified through the truth. He can talk of Christ and him crucified in a language that savors heaven. He can present the will of God to a man because his own heart has been brought into submission and has been glorified by the spirit of God. The son of righteousness has risen upon him, 
that he may reflect the brightness of the world. And when we get into these conversations with each other about these things, and many times we have to talk to each other, even if it's at random videos that we make to, to show and to talk about what we believe that might oppose somebody else's belief. I pray that in my own heart that I'm reflecting Christ. We are altogether too indifferent in regard to the Holy Spirit, which is to take possession of heart and character. Those who are enlightened by the Spirit of God can see only the things which are of the greatest importance in their human estimation. They must take phantoms for realities and realities for phantoms, calling a world an atom and an atom a world. In other words, small things big and big things small. They need the Holy Spirit to control heart and mind and to mold the character after the divine similitude. No one is safe in attempting to work without the Holy Spirit. The most powerful sermons may be preached, but the word spoken will be valueless unless it is accompanied by his Holy Spirit. And so with this week coming, the promised blessings, the multitude of blessings that we will receive in this week. And I want you all to really, really think about attending all the sessions and inviting people to attend with you. Because there's a great number of people who have some very good messages to impart this week. And you will receive a blessing, double the blessing that you normally do, because that is what Tabernacles is about, is receiving a blessing. And through Bible explorations and them, them being doubly blessed by the Lord, you will partake of it. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent and without the sacrifice of Christ, would have been of no avail. Sin could never be resisted and overcome only by the mighty agency of a third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes essential what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It's by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of divine, divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character on his church and his ministries. Why do we not hunger and thirst for the gift of the spirit? Since this is the means by which we are to receive power. Why do we not talk of it? Pray for it. Preach concerning it. The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to us than the parents are to give good gifts to their children. For the baptism of the Spirit, every worker should be pleading with God. This promised blessing, if claimed by faith, would bring all other blessings in its train, and it's to give, be given liberally to the people of God. Through the cunning devices of the enemy, the minds of God's people seem to be incapable of comprehending and appropriating the promises of God. They seem to think that only the scantiest showers of grace are to fall upon the thirsty soul. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. We are being so sidetracked. We are being so taken advantage of by the evil one. Think about that in it this week. Be faithful in your attendance this week. The gift. The promise of the gift of the Spirit of God is left as a matter to be, of, be little considered by the church. It is not impressed upon the people, and the result is only that which might be expected. There is a spiritual drought, a spiritual darkness, a spiritual declension and death. I mentioned a bit earlier, I was watching the sermons um, that was held by Pastor Tess Wilson and by some of the other officials. I still from time to time watch just to see as an interest 
what is still happening in that church I so dearly loved. And I am amazed, amazed at how political it's become, just how cold it's become, how dark it's become. And minor matters occupy the mind and soul, but the divine power, which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church, which, which would, if possessed, bring all other blessings in its train, is lacking, although it's offered to us in infinite plentitude. Just as long as the church are satisfied with the small things, they are disqualified to receive the great things of God. But why do we not hunger and thirst after the gift of the Holy Spirit, since it's the means whereby the heart may be kept pure? It is all essential for the Christian to understand the learning of the promise of the Holy Spirit just prior to the coming of our Lord Jesus for the second time. Talk of it. Pray for it. Preach concerning it. So while engaged in our daily work, we should lift the soul in heaven to prayer. These silent petitions rise like incense before the throne of grace and the enemy is baffled. The Christian whose heart is just thus stayed upon God cannot be overcome. No evil arts can destroy his peace. All the promises of God's word, all the power of divine grace, all the resources of Jehovah are pledged to secure his deliverance. It was thus that Enoch walked with God, and God was with him, a present help in a time of need. So watch, pray, and work. Whether it be in ministry, whether it be at your work place, wherever it may be, those who teach and preach the most effectively are those who wait humbly upon God and watch hungrily for his guidance and his grace. Watch, pray, work. This is the Christian's watchword. The life of a true Christian is the life of constant prayer. And how do we not do that? He knows that the light and strength of day is not sufficient for the trials and conflicts of the next. Satan is continually changing his temptations. Every day we shall be placed in the different circumstances. And in the untried scenes that await us, we shall be surrounded by fresh dangers and constantly assailed by new and unexpected temptations. It is only through the strength and grace gained from heaven that we can hope to meet the temptations and perform the duties before us. Folks, I want to say something this evening, and it might not be very Adventist, but you know what? Satan has also read the spirit of prophecy. He's also read the Bible. He also knows what's coming. The thing is, he can do anything and he can change anything or try and change it. If we lose sight of the Lord by not having the spirit with us, we will be led into these things. Just look at where we were 10 years ago. Terabella, 2013, 22nd of October, we had Feast of Tabernacles. The USA was sitting with a dead ceiling. Your government had closed down. There was trouble in America. Now, 10 years later, exactly the same problems, just worse. Our country, from where it was 10 years ago, has gone through one tremendous amount of issues. An economy that was okay has been destroyed. Satan is doing everything in his power to destroy us as a people. And he does it by means of our surroundings. He does it by means of us putting us into things we were not used to before. We are living in uncharted times. And the only way we can be prepared for it is if we pray, if we ask for the Holy Spirit, and if we, we accept the Lord's gifts. And those gifts are the outpouring. Let us humbly ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that we can be transformed in God's image, reflect his character, and be empowered by the Lord's Spirit to fulfill God's vision and task he is giving us.
Let us pray for the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, that he can do his work for us, in us, and around us, and through us. The prophet Joel explains that what God will do in the last days and promises, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in these days. Joel 2, 28 and 29. So let us pray with David. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm footing. Psalm 143, 10. Paul powerfully asserts, all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Romans 8, 14. So what was the ministry God gave me? Well, basically, it was the coal Pitya ministry. And as a fresh, young, bright-eyed, new Seventh-day Adventist, because I loved reading and because I wanted to find out more about this living God, he steered me into a ministry that when I look back on my Google photos over the last 10 years, just still astounds me about what was achieved through him a thousand ways our heavenly father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing those who accepted one principle of making the service of god supreme will find perplexities vanish and the plain path before their feet ministry of healing 481 results not measured by apparent successes we are to be sincere, earnest Christians, doing faithfully the duties placed in our hands and looking ever to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Our reward is not dependent upon our seeing success, but only upon the spirit in which the work is done. As canvases and evangelists, you may not have had the successes you prayed for, but remember that you do not know and cannot measure the result of your faithful effort. Manuscript 20, 1905. In terms of that little story, we had at that stage in 2009, 2010, through the, the, the bookshop that I started, we had started purchasing uh, DVD uh, uh, um, uh, machines, uh, multipliers and, 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 and uh, 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 copiers. Um, the church only had one when I joined. Um, when I left, there was, I think it was 12. Um, and through the books and the, the selling of the books that we had gotten from everywhere, we started making DVDs. And those DVDs we threw out into the world, like Ellen White says, like the leaves from autumn. They went out in the world. And two or three years later, somebody did a testimony in our church about a Mark Woodman DVD that he found in India. That led him to the Lord. That DVD had my phone number on it. And had gone right around the world. From South Africa to Australia. From Australia to Singapore. Where it eventually landed in India. No need for discouragement. When there's only a continual reliance upon God. A continual practice of self-denial. The workers will not sink into discouragement. They will not worry. They will remember that in every place there are souls of whom the God has, who the Lord has need and whom the devil is seeking that he may bind them as, as fast in slavery of sin, of disregard for the law of God. Victory will be given. The canvasser need not be discouraged if he is called to encounter difficulties in his work. Let him work in faith and victory will be given. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world. Whenever a book is presented that will expose error, Satan is closed by the side of the one to whom it's offered that, and urges reasons why it should not be accepted. But a divine agency is at work to influence the minds in favor of light. Ministering angels will oppose their power to that of Satan. And when through the influence of the Holy Spirit, 
The truth is received in the mind and heart. It will have a transforming power upon the character. Manuscript 31, 1890. So look heavenward in faith. Take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has he not invited you to come unto him? Never allow yourself to talk in hopelessness or in a discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. By looking at appearances and a complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you will give evidence of a sickly and feeble faith. Talk and act if, as if your faith was invincible. The Lord is rich in resources, and I can attest to that. He owns the world. Look heavenward in faith. Look to him who is the light and power and efficiency. Christ Object Lessons 146, 147. Believe God's promise. Folks, believe it. <laughs> I can truly testify to that. Those who work for God will meet with discouragement. And the more discouragement you get, the more you must know that you're on the right path. But the promise is always theirs. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 20. God will give you the most wonderful experience to those who will say, I believe thy promise. I will not fail nor become discouraged. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6. The Savior will send help. The precious Savior will send help just when we need it. The way to heaven is consecrated by his footprints. Every thorn that wounds our feet has wounded his. Every cross that we are called to bear, he has borne before us. The Lord permits conflicts to prepare the soul for peace. Great Controversy 633. And for those of you who don't know, the mission book for the next two years for the Seventh-day Adventist Church is The Great Controversy. The biggest turnaround in history from going from The Great Hope, a book that desecrated the Seventh-day Adventist message, to suddenly a book that is now supposed to go to the world as the official mission book. And so I thought let me testify just and show you just some of the thousands of pictures I have of my shop that I used to have when I was still in the church, a shop that I was forced to close when the church, after repeated sanctioning uh, and, and, and just false charges, forced me out of the church. I had the shop since 2009. It grew from a shop that roughly started with $150 worth of stock to a shop that had close on $200,000 worth of stock. We did camp meetings. We used to go to camp meetings with a five-ton truck full of books and DVDs. You can see this is the one of the last camp meetings Philip and myself did. We had so much good things that we could put to people because in South Africa, we don't have an ABC. And Sandy, I was looking at the ABC that Pastor Randy had took me to at the California conference. I still, I placed the photo on my Facebook and it brought bring back so much memories of what we have as in the Adventists. We had a wall of 19 meters worth of DVDs. I had contracts and uh, agreements with ministries ranging from three ABN. Amazing facts, amazing discoveries. Um, little light ministries. You can see I was selling the the uh, uh, what is it the, the the video or the uh, um, decoders that the people could watch, and that's how we watched BTV the first time was one on the, one of these decoders. There was Harvest Time books in the back, thousands upon thousands of boxes of Harvest Time books, which has got uh, has got all the Spirit of Prophecy books. Everything that you could imagine in ABC, we either imported, printed, or made in South Africa. And so as you walked into my official shop, which consisted three rooms in the church, this is what you would see. I always was so proud of what the Lord had allowed me to do. And 
And this was another shop that we did. I just took a picture from the top. Once again, you will see these uh, display things we had. All of these things came over time. When I wanted or needed stuff, the Lord would give them to me. And so we were so, so blessed. That's Diane standing at the bottom right here. That's me there looking much younger with a cap on, talking to one of the pastors of the conference. And so all of these things were put there for people to do their mission. But that's the past. So what is in our future? Well, folks, we are living in different times and we cannot let Satan stop us. And so we are on Zoom currently. We talk to each other on WhatsApp, Facebook, Telegram, you name it. We have found ways of talking to each other. There's something called the cloud, which pretty soon my intention is to create a cloud library. And through the faithfulness of people and the help of the Lord through those people, we've been able to procure a specialized scanner in which we can then scan 300 pages of a book in eight minutes and upload fully color brochure uh, or complete books onto the cloud where people can access them and use them. So I have roughly a library of close on 3,000 different Seventh-day Adventist books because I had a, a shop. I've closed on 65 different types of Bibles. My wife said, what are you going to do with those one day when we retire? Well, I'm going to start scanning them in now because I'm taking them with me. And hopefully the Lord will allow me to run the bookshop in heaven. So let us not underestimate these times. Danger of hesitating and doubting as the prophet Jonah thought of the difficulties and seemingly impossibilities of his commission. He was tempted to question the wisdom of the call. While he hesitated, still doubting, Satan overwhelmed him with discouragement. And the charge given him, Jonah had been entrusted with a heavy responsibility. Yet he who had bidden him to go was, was able to sustain his servant and grant him success. Prophets and Kings 2.66. Let courage fail not. Never let your courage fail. Yes, we get disheartened. Yes, the world is, is hard. But never talk unbelief because appearances are against you. As you work for the master, you will feel pressure for want of means. But the Lord will hear you and answer your petitions for help. Let your language be, the Lord will help me, and therefore I shall not be confounded. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know I shall not be ashamed. Isaiah 50, 70. And I know this to be true. Because as much as people are faithful in the official church, they are faithful outside of the church. And I want to encourage you to continue your faithfulness to, to ministries like Bible Explorations. The work that is done there through Sandy and through David Baxter and through everybody involved on that side is tremendous, huge. It cannot be left. It cannot be allowed to stop. So let us be hopeful and courageous. Despondency in God's service is sinful and unreasonable. He knows our every necessity. He has all power. He can bestow upon his servants the measure of efficiency that is need that they need uh, that need their demands. Testimonies for the church. So getting to the end. Work with what you have. You know, not everybody can have a shop. We started small. Not everybody can have an independent ministry like we have outside of the church. I started small. In my time, I have I have seen and done things I could never have imagined. I have organized camp meetings in which the church laughed at me. But what happened? We brought many saints together that were outside of the church. And it became a threat because the people saw what the Lord had achieved through us. Be strong and talk hope. Press your way through obstacles. You are in spiritual wedlock with Jesus Christ. The word is your assurance. Approach your Savior with full confidence of living faith, 
joining your hands with his. Go where he leads the way. Whatsoever he says to you, do it. He will teach you just as willingly as he will teach someone else. That comes from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6. Exercise the faith of Caleb. It was Caleb's faith in God that gave him courage, that kept him from the fear of man, even the mighty giants, the sons of Anak, and enabled him to stand boldly and unflinchingly in defense of the right. From the same exalted source, the mighty general of the armies of heaven, every true soldier of the cross of Christ must receive strength and courage to overcome the obstacles that often seem so insurmountable. We want Caleb's now, who with courageous words will make strong report in favor of immediate action. Work with determination. These in the service of God must show animation and determination in work of winning souls. Remember that there are those who will perish unless we as God's instrumentalities work with a determination that will not fail nor become discouraged. The throne of grace is to be our continual dependence. Testimonies on the Church, Volume 6. So do not shy away from the modern channels. Face difficulties bravely. Difficulties will arise. We all battle with IT at some stage. We all get frustrated. We all do ourselves a disservice by saying, I cannot do this or I cannot do that. The Lord will help you. And if you can't, either a video on YouTube or Hein will help you. Face them bravely. Look on the bright side. If the work is hindered, be sure that it's not your fault. And then go forward, rejoicing in the Lord. Trials mean benefit. But when the tribulation comes upon us, how many of us are like Jacob? We think it the hand of the enemy, and in the darkness we wrestle blindly until our strength is spent, and we find no comfort or deliverance. We also need to learn that trials mean benefit, and not to despise the chastening of God, nor faint when we are rebuked of him. Thoughts of the Mount of Blessing. So to end off with, nothing is impossible. Ellen White wrote this piece. She said, prayer is the answer to every problem in life. It puts us in tune with divine wisdom, which knows how to adjust everything perfectly. So often do not, we do not pray in certain situations because from our standpoint, the outlook is hopeless. But nothing is impossible with God and believe that. Nothing is so entangled that it cannot be remedied. No human relationship is too strained for God to bring about human reconciliation and understanding. No habit is so deep-rooted that it cannot be overcome. No one is so weak that he cannot be strong. No one is so ill that he cannot be healed. No mind is so dull that it cannot be made brilliant. Whatever we need, if we trust in God, he will supply it. If anything is causing worry or anxiety, let us stop rehearsing the difficulty and trust God for healing, love, and power. Into the experience of all, there come times of keen disappointment and utter discouragement. Days when sorrow is portion, and it's hard to believe that God is still the kind benefactor of his earthborn children. Days when trouble harass the soul till death seems preferable to life. It is then that many lose their hold on God and are brought onto the slavery of doubt, the bondage of unbelief. Could we at such times discern with spiritual insight the meaning of God's providences? We should see angels seeking to save us from ourselves, striving to plant our feet upon the foundation more firm than the everlasting hills and new faith would spring into being. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful week that is lying ahead of us. We thank you for the people that is attending, and we ask a great blessing upon all of you, as you have promised, Lord, a double portion of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask that you strengthen each and every person each and every speaker, each and every listener and viewer.
mission, Lord, is there for us until you come. Strengthen us so we can walk that path. We ask this in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.